thought of uh, when Brother Tommy was up here talking. It seemed like an odd story to some of you, maybe, but there was. Uh, I was sitting in a church service with a, a grandpa and a dad and a son, three generations of holiness preachers. And uh, the young boy, he was all fired up. He just started preaching. And he was really trying to fix the church and correct everybody and straighten them all out, you know. Just started preaching. Boy, he had the bull by the horns. And uh, he talked to his dad. His dad told him some things. You know, back in the day, we'd shout all night long. Back in the day, we'd have church five, six hours. Back in the day, we have 35 night revivals. Back in the day, and he was hitting all the highlights of the greatest things he could remember of the church days in the past. And that boy went to his grandpa during the church service. I was sitting right by him, and the boy was maybe 20 or so, and he looked at his grandpa, and he said, he said, Grandpa, the church just ain't like it used to be. I'll never forget for the rest of my life, his grandpa said, son, it never was. And that sat so odd to me. It almost sounded sacrilegious. He said, grandpa, the church just ain't what it used to be. And he said, son, it never was. <coughs> and I thought about that and thought, I thought, why would you discourage him like that? That just didn't make any sense. And uh, I asked the boy several years later, I said, you ever, you ever finish that conversation with your grandpa? <laughs> he said, what conversation are you talking about? I said, do you remember telling him in a church service one time that the churches ain't what it used to be? And he looked right at you and said, it never was. He said, oh, yeah, I remember. I said, do you ever explain that to you? And he said, yes, sir. I said, would you explain it to me? <laughs> He said, I got all fired up on my dad's ideas about the greatest revival we ever had, the greatest service we ever had, the best times we ever had. And I was trying to envision that in my mind and make my life like that. And I was upset because the church wasn't as high as it was at a certain time in the past. And so many people wouldn't get saved as much as they was at a certain time in the past. And certain things wasn't happening as much as they was certain times in the past. And he said, I had my mind wrapped around the perfect church environment and it was driving me crazy that I couldn't get our church to that point. <coughs> and he said, my grandpa talked to me and told me, he said, son, we had backsliders, we had downtime, we had hurts, we had pains. Have I done something this microphone made? Yeah, oh, I killed it. He said, he said, son, we had down times, we had hurts, we had pains, we had dry times, we had bills. And what he was trying to do was explain to that young man that you can't just take all the good highlights of somebody else's life, somebody else's ministry, somebody else's church, somebody else's family, and try to make your life fit just the highlights of their life. And then when you can't get there, you get all upset and discouraged. <laughs> you have to understand that everybody, everybody has to fight. Everybody has to get through the rain and get through the storm and get through the hurt and get through the, the, the trauma and the drama and the, everybody. So don't, don't fall for that old trick and that old trap that, well, if I just could live like Tommy and Kim could, <laughs> if I just understood it like old Pastor Todd does, everybody fights. Sure. And the ones that do and hold on to Jesus and keep coming back for more and keep trying to understand and keep getting a foothold in the rock and holding on for a little while, they're the ones that make it. Period. Yes. Uh, hallelujah. And every single one that the devil could throw something at you good enough to where you say, you know, it just ain't worth it no more. Those are the ones that lose. That's right. 
I remember a man told me years ago, we were doing some Christian counseling. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian counselor and, and I was doing some counseling and I had some issues and this man came and he'd been counseling for 30 years longer than me and he began to talk to me and he told me something that I've, I, I try to always remember. He said, he said, Todd, you have to understand if there's anything that can happen to a person that would cause them to turn back on God, that's what the devil will pay. That's what the devil will pay. You could be one of those people. I wouldn't do it for this. I wouldn't go back for that. I wouldn't stop for this. I would. There's, but there's that one thing. If that one thing happened, I don't know if I can. That's what will happen. That's what the devil will pay. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I feel a little preachy. Y'all might be in trouble. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Appreciate the revival. Appreciate your attendance. I want the Lord to help somebody tonight. And I've got about four or five points here that I promise you I won't preach more than 30 minutes to two hours. And, uh, and I'll get them in right here. Luke 23 and 39, the Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. This is one of my favorite sets of scriptures. I've preached it many, many different ways. I've preached this sermon many different times. I'll be honest with you, I might have preached it here for all I know. But this is what I felt like all afternoon. I want to preach a little while about the man in the middle. The man in the middle. Or sometimes I call it the belief of a thief. The belief of a thief. See, there is a very colorful and somewhat shady cast of characters around Golgotha's cross and on the Via Della Rosa where we read and in the courtyard and the milling about in the temple precincts in Luke chapter 23. The disciples have all fled and they're in hiding except the beloved disciple John. The women are weeping and the heart of Mary, his mother, is broken into a million pieces and there are self-righteous religious leaders looking on and finally satisfied and the Pharisees are there and the Sadducees are there and Judas has already hung himself and there, there's no doubt some who are disgusted at the gory sight of Calvary yet they cannot look away. Knowing what I know about Humanity, I would say that there somewhere near the crosses at Calvary, some had set up shop short term and they were probably taking bets on how long each one of the three was going to last. Pilate had been involved in these deaths and this murder. Herod was in on it. The Roman soldiers are participating in it. All manner of people are in the crowds watching. And right here at the most crucial moment in history since the creation week, all uh, amongst the blood and the gore and the weeping and the wailing and the betting and the jeering and the mocking, nobody gets it. Nobody senses what's really, really happening. Some people see uh, a, a death. Some people see a, a, a murder. Some people see a tragedy. Some people think that their, their hopes in Christ is dashed against the rocks. Some people are mocking and saying, we told you he wasn't God. But nobody understood that that was God's perfect sacrifice to fix every one of our lives. Nobody but a thief. <coughs> One man got what happened on Calvary when it happened. 
The Pharisees were there. They represented ecclesiasticism or what we would call uh, 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 ministerialism, and they absolutely did not get it. The Sadducees were present, and they had their social privilege or their aristocratic type bloodline. They absolutely didn't get it. Judas obviously represented nationalism. He didn't get it. Pilate represented opportunism. He didn't get it. Herod represented secularism or worldlyism. He absolutely did not get it. The soldiers that were there no doubt represented militarism. They didn't get it. The public crowd represented an acquiescence to wicked and morally bankrupt government and an alliance with blasphemous religion and nobody got it. But a thief. A thief got it. See, we have one on the other side of, uh, one on each side of Jesus, the precious Christ. We have these, these two malefactors, these two thieves, two hardened criminals, one on the left, one on the right. One is dying in sin because he said, if thou be Christ, I don't know if you are or not, but if you are, save yourself. And hey, while you're saving yourself, won't you throw us in there too? Can you hear his selfishness on the cross? He's looking for cheap. What will you give me if I believe in you grace? He's hedging his bets. He's playing both sides against the middle. Down here in Texas, you'd probably call him a fence straddler. He serves God the way a lot of people I know serve God. When God is blessing me, I'm in church. When my life's falling apart, I'm out. He didn't get it. <laughs> I guess you could be God. I, I, I don't know anything about, but if you are, then at least do something for yourself and, and do something for us too. This is, what can you give me, Grace? How many of y'all here? love somebody your wife your husband your children your parents we all have a love how many of you the person that you love has perfectly respected you and treated you amazingly every second of every day of your life if that's true you come take the mic we want to hear about it <laughs> No, but what do we do? We endure. Sure. We're there for each other. And then the good days are even better. And the better days are amazing. Because we stayed, we endured, we fought. These people didn't get it. They had Christianity on the margins. They had what some people already called Burger King religion, having Jesus, but having him your way. That's coming to church for two weeks and then missing for three. Somebody help me preach. That's Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day kind of faith. That's that. Uh, uh, he, he was in church the last time I came through Texas, and this time I'm here. He's not in, but maybe next time I come through, he'll be back in. He said, if. If you are the Christ, listen, only people straddling the fence use the word if when they're talking about my Jesus. There's no if in Jesus Christ. The thief on the right hand, however, is dying to sin. The thief on the left is dying in sin. The thief on the right is dying to sin because the thief on the right recognized that the man in the middle is dying for sin. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So he rebuffs the other malefactor. He rebukes his partner in crime. He silences the other criminal. He says, you are dying on a cross, man. Don't you even now fear God? And then I want to begin to show you how one man got it when it happened on Calvary. He says, we are here because we deserve it. And this man have done nothing wrong. 
So this is the first thing that I want you to be sure to notate this evening. This thief got it because he knew that in his case, wrath was deserved. I need to tell somebody that even though you may be sitting here with your church clothes on and you got your church face on and, and underneath all of that and behind all of that, if you still have sin in your life, you just need to realize that you're getting what you deserve and the only way out is the man in the middle. Right. As a matter of fact, every man, woman, boy, and girl within the sound of my voice deserves and will receive eternal punishment except for the man in the middle, if it wasn't for him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible teaches us. We were all in line to go to hell, but he died for us. He died to assuage the wrath of God from sinners. One man said sinners like us, no sir and no ma'am. Not sinners like us, sinners that are us. Jesus didn't die for sinners like me. Jesus died for a sinner that is me. Amen. Let me talk to you for a moment about some of the fallacies of prosperity preaching that we're hearing all across America and some of the fallacies of some of this cheap gospel, that, if you will, that is being preached in the pulpits. When people hear that kind of preaching enough and subscribe to that kind of preaching enough, then they begin to believe that, that we are deserving of something from God and somehow God is in our debt just because we acknowledge to be on his side. I've heard it many, many times when trying to counsel people in desperate situations. They, instead of running back to the feet of the cross or instead of uh, repenting over what they might have done wrong, they begin to list for me all of the good things they've been doing for God. But I go to church faithfully, but I pay my tithe, but I do this, but I don't do bad things, but I don't lie, but I don't steal. As if God is bound to give us something and do something for us if we say the right words and recite the right portions of scriptures and, and attribute everything positive in life to him. And God is now bound to owe us some junk if we do things in the right order and according to the right formula. Let me tell somebody this evening what God owes each and every one of us. He owes us death and judgment and wrath and hell. You see, the reason the Bible makes sense to me, the reason why church works for me, the reason that there's, there even is preaching as far as I'm concerned is because of the wrath that should have been poured out on my sorry worthless hide for making such a mess of the perfect plan of God. He chose to pour it out on his son instead. That's the only way church makes sense to me. Jesus died to take away my sins and I still have a wrath deserved. And the only way I can get out of the wrath that I still deserve is to be clothed in the blood of Christ. When I get there. <laughs> Amen. And nobody got that but the thief. The Pharisees didn't get it. The Sadducees didn't get it. The temple priests, the doctors of the law, nobody got it. He said, we deserve what we receive. See, once he acknowledged that he deserved wrath, it made it simpler and easier for him to beg for mercy. When we think we're good enough, when we think we're okay, when we think we're doing our best, when we think all our problems are everybody else's fault, it's hard to get humble enough to ask for mercy. But when you acknowledge what you really deserve, it's pretty easy to ask for mercy. Beyond a wrath deserved. Look now at the next thing he had here was a wisdom displayed. A wisdom displayed. Remember that this man is a thief. He hasn't been attending church. He's not been paying his tithes and offerings. He's a thief. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he didn't come to the cross from Sunday school. 
He's a thief. He's a crook. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He doesn't have a maintained prayer life. But somehow there is a wisdom that is so basic and so powerful that, that he displays that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Pilate, Herod, the crowd, the soldiers, even Jesus' own followers did not display the wisdom that the thief did that day. So the first thing we got to have is a wrath deserved. We have to understand that. The next thing we have to have is a wisdom displayed. How many times do we react to our trials in our life out of pure emotion? How many times have you made a, a, a quick blood pumping, anger, sadness, rage, depression type decision and it worked out good for you? Anybody? He wasn't acting emotionally. He understood he had a wrath deserved. And logically, he understood that, that he, had, he, he began to apply a wisdom displayed. Just looking at Jesus. Won't you catch this? No doubt probably seeing him for the first time, getting an up close and personal view of Jesus Christ. He says, this man has made no mistakes. Now, remember, this guy, just like anybody else, he's been all over his part of the country. All of his buddies are probably criminals. He's a criminal. Everybody lies. He lies. They all cheat each other. And, and, and all of a sudden he sees Jesus for the first time. And he says, that guy's never made a mistake. He's done nothing amiss, is what the Bible says. I'm asking you today, where could this thief have been to have acquired that kind of knowledge? Who would have known in the circles that he ran in that could have told him how perfect Jesus is. This man most likely had zero foreknowledge of who Jesus was until he got to take a really good close look at him. This cat wasn't there when Jesus turned water into wine. Doubtedly, he was there when, when, when uh, nowhere around Jesus when he walked on water, when he raised the young lady from the dead. He probably knew nothing about Jesus feeding 5,000 with two fishes and five barley loaves. This guy did not witness when uh, uh, the woman with the issue of blood straightened up and became whole just by touching the hem of Christ's clothes. He wasn't there when Jesus turned tables over in the inner court and drove people out with a whip. He wasn't there when the blind man cried, thou son of David, have mercy on me only to be beckoned to by the master and subsequently healed of his lifelong blindness. How could this thief know that Jesus had never done anything wrong? He only had a look. This makes me want to say something right now to somebody. Please, I beg you, take another look at Jesus. Come on, brother. Get a good, hard, sobering, serious, sincere look. It'll always do something for you. I'm going to tell you right now, I was raised around church folk, but I never went to church. I was offered Christ. I couldn't tell you how many times in my life. I thought I was a decent person. I thought I was a moral person. Even when I was in the gangs, even when I was taking drugs, even when I was an alcoholic, I still considered myself better than most people I knew. I had prayed at different times in my life. I had been at a church different times in my life. I had bowed at an altar different times in my life. And if you'd have asked me at 12 or 15 or 20 or 24, I probably would have told you. I thought I knew Jesus. I felt like I'd prayed. I felt, but at 25 years old on a Sunday morning at a little old country church in Wilder, Idaho, I can't even explain exactly what brought me to that place. But I can tell you this. I was losing my 
wife. I was losing access to my two sons. I was losing my job. I was losing everything that I held dear and maybe it just got me to that point. But they offered me the same Jesus that I'd been offered lots of times before. And that morning I got down at an altar and I got a really good hard look at him and I saw something that I never saw before. I didn't just see a religious character. I didn't just see somebody that I was supposed to obey his rules. But I felt something down in my soul and I got a look brother Tommy at the one the man in the middle that died for my sins that gave me power that I did not have that helped me stand up when I was too weak to stand that made me willing to do things that I was never willing to do before there is a way and I wish I could explain it to you point by point and word by word all I can tell you is don't ever stop trying until you get there there is an access that every one of us can find and all of a sudden when you find it you know it that you have come to the place that you accept Jesus Christ Messiah for who he really is and it changes everything including your desires <laughs> look at him every chance you get look into him <sighs> Look at his beaten brow. Look at his compassionate countenance. Look at his flawless face, his merciful mannerisms, the, the clarity of his character. Jesus Christ deserves another look. Because nobody, nowhere, in no way, shape, or form compares to Jesus. If you're willing to spend money to see a doctor, you should be willing to spend more if necessary to get an appointment with this great physician. If you're putting your trust in a therapist, you should be willing to have some sessions with the mighty counselor of heaven. If you trust in the wisdom of your attorney, you should trust all the more in the eternal wisdom of the mediator between God and man. He is in the class all by himself. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm blessed tonight to declare to you that there is none like Jesus. He does not belong in a list with Socrates. Aristotle was not his peer. His skill levels are not likened unto Napoleon. Napoleon or George Washington. Nobody could stand in a room where Jesus stands. He outclasses all the classes. Nothing can measure up to him. I've had pressure in my life just like you have. I've had pain in my body just like you've had. I've had peer pressure and I've had to face my own weaknesses and I've had family coming apart and, and the only thing I've ever learned friend is every time I can get any of those situations in the direct presence of Jesus it all has to bow and one man got it <laughs> I'm tired of folk trying to convince me to mingle a little goodness in with my preaching. My preaching is about Jesus, and Jesus is the source of all goodness. I'm supposed to sprinkle in a little higher learning with my preaching and add the wisdom of the modern age with my teaching. I am preaching and teaching about Christ Jesus, Emmanuel, and he is all wisdom and he is the source of all knowledge. You cannot figure anything out. You cannot solve a problem. You cannot hold anything together but by an ingredient that comes from Jesus. Somebody said Jesus was a good man and a great teacher. No, he was the man and the teacher. <laughs> I don't, I don't think we grasp, oh, I like to hear about Jesus. Oh, I like, I like poems about Jesus on my wall. But I like other things, too. I like fishing and hunting. And y'all know I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about in general. <laughs> I had to walk around in Michael and Sandy's yard today of their new house in the red clay with my high-polished Stacy Adams. I had to take them back and brush them and brush them to get all that red mud off them. <laughs> I'm what y'all around here call a city slicker. <laughs> 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 
Him talking about Jesus was good. I like Jesus in my life. I like Psalm 23 on the wall in my office. I don't think we get it. Everything you like exists because he said so. And you could take it away in the bat of an eye. Jesus is the one that taught birds to sing. Jesus is the one that told grass to be green in the spring and, and told it to, to wither in the fall. Jesus is the one that taught water to run downhill. He's the one that spun the earth at a certain point on the axis that gave the gravity tones that we have that we can walk up by. Jesus is everything. Nicodemus was a good man. John the Baptist was a good man. Paul was a good man. Jesus was the God man. He's in a class all by himself. Give him another look. It doesn't matter how great people are in your life. They will let you down. If I live the rest of my life trying to serve my pastor, eventually he'd let me down. If my wife lived the rest of her life trying to serve me sooner or later, and, and probably sooner than later, I'd let her down. <laughs> if everybody would plug back in directly to Jesus, it'd work, y'all. It'd work. Give him another look. He's all you need. If you're sick, he already said he's our doctor. If you're in trouble, he's our lawyer. If you're lonely, he's a best friend. If you're down, he can pick you up. If you're out, he can bring you in. If you're lost, he's the savior, redeemer. If you don't know which way to turn, he can direct your path. But you've got to search him out. Amen. Jesus is all that I need in this world. Y'all ever sung that song? Jesus is all that you need. Let me ask somebody a question tonight. Are you going to let this thief get it? And you ain't going to get it? Are you going to let just a common criminal that was actually put to death for his horrible sins get it? And you ain't even going to get it? You're going to let this thief go to paradise and you ain't even going to make it to paradise. I mean, y'all, I ought to have as much sense as a thief, right? <laughs> At least. If a criminal can get it, what about us in church every Sunday, hearing his name, listening to his truths? What if we don't get it? The criminal understood something. He understood it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what somebody tonight needs to understand. Yes, church is wonderful and it's part of it. The Bible is super important and it's part of it. Uh, having a pastor and going to Sunday school and reading your Bible, saying your prayers, that's all part of it. But you will never be put all the perfect pieces in your life. I pray 15 minutes every morning, six days a week. I go to church on the seventh day. I always read my Bible at 6 a.m. and at 7.30 p.m. And I always treat this person right and treat them. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle trying to put it on. You can't do it. But I'm telling you, if you focus on Jesus, 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 he will make it work for you in, in a way that only God can. He'll give you the strength when it's not there. He'll let you walk on your own strength when you can. He'll give you answers that you're not smart enough to know. It's about Jesus and our personal relationship and walk with him. The only way you can know if you really got it is if once you look at Jesus, you cannot leave without being changed. <laughs> See, I can look back at my life now and realize lots of times I touched Jesus. Lots of times I prayed to Jesus. Lots of times I went to church. But I didn't change. 
And the only way you can know that you saw what you needed to see when you looked at Jesus is if you can leave and you can't stay the same. You can't go back and not be different. You will talk about him. As a matter of fact, you'll talk to him. And as a matter of fact, you want folk to talk to you about him. You will get better by being in direct contact with him to the point that it'll cause you to want to be in more contact with him because that'll make you even better to the point that you want to be in more contact with him because that'll make you even better. If that's not the way it's working, keep, keep coming because you're not there yet. Listen to me, friends. It is a waste of time to get up and get dressed and go to church on Sunday morning and come back on Sunday night and attend midweek service or Bible study or prayer meeting and memorize scriptures and associate with only certain class of religious folk just to not even make it. Ain't nobody going to heaven because they belong to this church or that church or that group. Ain't nobody going to heaven because they hang out with these folks and only these folks. Ain't nobody going to heaven because they've checked a bunch of things off the list that they're supposed to do and supposed to not do. Ain't nobody going to heaven that way. We don't have the capability. If you're one of those people that is trying so hard, I got to wear one of these and I can't wear one of these and I got to go here, but I can't go there and I got to be with this person, but I can't be with that person. I got to buy one of these, but I can't buy one of those. Stop! That won't get you there. It's to get so close to Jesus that something finally clicks and you finally understand that it's all about your relationship with him. And then that stuff can, a lot of it will just work out. Because you've plugged into a source that understands what's going to work. I got I to gotta move on. You know, there's that song that said, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his praise. <laughs> Sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. The sweetest name I know. See, there is a wrath deserved. We have to understand there is a wisdom displayed that we can get by plugging into him. And then the next part, part is always the same. There is a worship demonstrated. There is a worship demonstrated. Listen, the thief told his partner in crime, leave this man alone. Don't you even now fear God? This man had done nothing amiss. Now, now catch his worship. He said, Lord, now, now, all you religious folk, just wait right there. Put the brakes on. We all know, us Bible readers for all these years, we know what he said. He said, Lord, remember me. And he began to make... One of the problems with, with religious folk and the Bible is we know it too well. I know that sounds like a, a, a hypocritical statement, but part of the problem is we just know the Bible too well. There is so much in there. Anybody have heard of Vance Havner, one of the greatest American preachers of our lifetime? He's passed away now, but he was one of the, by far one of the greatest preachers that ever lived while I was alive, Vance Havner. Do you know there's one verse in Jude chapter, or Jude verse 2. There's no chapters in Jude. Jude verse 2. Do you know that's the only verse he ever preached on? Did you know that? Go back and listen to every Vance Havner message you can find on the internet. Every one of them, his text is Jude verse 2. Contending for the faith. That's all he ever preached was contending for the faith. He preached over 50 years on contending for the faith. What are you saying? I'm saying the Bible is so deep. And we know too much that we miss a lot 
Most of us have been in church many, many, many years. And anytime you're reading through your Bible and you find out, well, uh, David's about to get eaten by a lion, you don't, you don't really buckle down and catch all of that. You know he's not going to get eaten by a lion. You know how it comes out. <coughs> you just jump right over there to the victory part. And you get to those, those scriptures where so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so, and they're telling who everybody's grandpa, great-grandpa, great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa. You don't read that. You skip over to where it starts telling a story again. There's some great stuff in there. You know, we, we read the, the, the book of uh, Genesis and we get to Noah's life and, and, and uh, God sent the flood and, and the whole earth drowned and there's just those eight souls on the boat and, and, and he's there and, and he, you know, everybody he knows just died. And, and he's dealing with, with, with an unseen God and he's, he's in a boat that's, that's never been built before and he, he doesn't know who's going to die and who's going to live and what's going to happen and if, if the earth is going to remain and all of a sudden he opens the, the window and he sends out a raven and it doesn't come back and he sends out a dove and a dove comes back and then all of a sudden we, we see we get to the point where God's promise comes. God's promise is when the dove comes back with the, with the little branch in its mouth, and we call that the, the, the promise of peace, and we understand that that's God telling Noah that everything's going to be all right. So in our minds, as soon as that promise comes back, Oh, man, we got Noah and his family over there, and they already built the log cabin, and they got a fire, and they're roasting weenies and marshmallows, and they got dogs and cats, and everything's great. Do you know how long it was from the time that, that the bird came back and Noah received the promise that God was going to make everything all right until he set foot on dry land again? 375 days. We skip that because we know how it's going to end up anyway. This is a huge problem, okay? Because if you know and you know and I know that every time Noah's in trouble, God rescues him. Every time uh, David's going to get to eat by a lion, God rescues him. Every time the three Hebrew boys are going to burn, God rescues him. If we know all of that, what we're missing is that God also was trying to tell us Noah went through some junk. He had to sit there and deal with that for over a year before God finally came through for him. He had to be faithful. We forget, yeah, they didn't burn but they did go in the furnace. We forget, no, the lion didn't need him, but he did go in the lion's den. Amen. Slow down when you read your Bible. I know people read the Bible through in a year, read the Bible through in a year. I've read the Bible 127 times. That's great. Do you know what it said? Do you know how it applies to your life? All right. Because right here, this thief is on the cross. And, and we're looking at a worship demonstrated the first time he spoke to Jesus, the first word he said was, Lord, that's just a man. He's dying just like I'm dying. That word Lord in the Greek Lord, there's four or five different words translated Lord, uh, uh, but that particular one, Lord in the Greek, that means my personal God. The first time he ever saw him was just a few moments ago, and the first thing he ever said to him was my personal God. Amen. Just looking at him, a thief called him Lord. The Pharisees didn't do that. The Sadducees didn't do that. Herod, Pilate, the crowd, the soldiers, the followers of Jesus didn't do that. Nobody worshipped at Calvary but a thief. Thank God somebody got it. Thank God this crook, this liar, this sinner figured out who he was. Thank God some of us crooks and liars and sinners around here figured out who he was. Thank God some more liars and crooks and sinners are still yet to figure out who he is. And realize and call him Lord. I wish I could find some folk that could admit that they should be in a lot more trouble tonight than they are. 
I wish I knew some folk that if they were honest this evening, they could admit that the county jail is where they should have ended up at best. I wish some folks right here in this service would just admit that if it wasn't for the man in the middle, we sure enough would be in hell right now. I wish somebody tonight would come to or come back to the realization that I'm nothing and I'm nobody and I'm no count and everything that I have accomplished and every good thing that I am and everything that I have is all because of him. Jesus is not your co-pilot. He's not your spare tire. He's not your sugar daddy. He's not your homie. He is my Lord. My personal God. Yes. He said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I know I don't deserve it. I know you ought to punish me for it. But for what it's worth at this point, Lord, please remember me. Is there anybody here that would say, Lord, remember me? (laughs) On my own, I'm not worth it. By myself, I make a mess of junk all the time. When choosing between right and wrong, I choose wrong two out of three. But now that I'm taking a closer look at you, now that I'm getting a good look at the man in the middle, something's rising back up in me. I don't know what I've been thinking these last few days. I don't know where the devil was taking me in my mind. Call it faith in the Lord, if you will, but uh, call it faith in the man in the middle. But something is rising back up in me. I just feel like, God, you are so good and you are are so holy and your sacrifice was so supreme that if you will Jesus if you'll remember me I'm trying to remember you you can fix my messed up raggedy self you can heal my entangled and ensnared situation just looking at you causes me to believe that if you will you could save my marriage if you will you can break my addiction if you will you can turn things back around for me you can fix my heart, fix my mind, destroy my desire for pornography. You can touch me, help me physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, spiritually. Lord, it's about you. And I've proven a thousand times I'll make a mess of this if it's not about you. You see, one of the primary reasons why, and I've alluded to it already, but one of the reasons why we don't get a lot of our help is because, and this isn't real deep theological, but it's true. A lot of times we don't get the help we need because we think we're pretty good. Don't raise your hand, but how many of us in here tonight, as a general rule, if we was honest with ourselves, we would think we're, we're, we're better than Morally, you know, 90% of the people we know. That's a dangerous way to think. That's a dangerous way to think. You could be sitting here. You got the right things going on for yourself religiously. You attend a good church. You like to hear gospel music. You, you have your tithe check made out before you get to church, but you still have some big issues in your life, and just going to church ain't going to fix them. Uh. You still have some secret mental, emotional, financial, spiritual battles going on, and they are raging in your life, and for some reason you just... Don't feel like you're as close to Jesus as old brother so-and-so. You just don't quite have the victory as much as old sister so-and-so. You just consider yourself a different type than they are. And then you still get to tell yourself that you're, you're pretty good. Somebody said, I never committed adultery. You thought about it. I never lied. You thought about it. Listen, I believe in living the victorious Christian life, but don't forget it's in Christ, not in you. You can't do this. I can't do this. (laughs) 
<laughs> Sometimes besides asking God to remember me right now, I need to remember me back then. I don't know if y'all know, have a brother like this in, in church sometimes. Where I come from, there's this one brother. He's, he's an older fella. Not so old that you'd mark him up to senility or anything like that, but he's, he's old. And we can get in the middle of a church service, almost every church service. And somebody could be over here filing their nails and somebody could be over here balancing their checkbook and somebody could be over here uh, uh, talking to so-and-so and oh, somebody's over here checking in on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Service isn't even really got going good yet. There's no real music or anything to get in. And that one brother will be standing in the front with his eyes closed and his hands in the air and tears running down his face. We haven't even acknowledged that the church service has even started yet. You know what's going on? He still remembers. I like to tell people this way, Brother Nathan, I was lost before I got saved. I know a bunch of folks that act like they weren't. But I still remember. Yeah. I remember where my decisions and my mentality and my desires got me. Yeah. They got me kicked out of my house. <clears throat> they got me locked up on a mental hold for trying to shoot myself. I, I still remember. They got me told to my face I would never see my two boys ever again. I still remember. <laughs> Lord, I need you to remember me, but I need to remember me too. I remember when we called, Lord, and you answered. I remember when the doctor said it was bad and you showed up and fixed it. I remember when I was afraid that it was all finally going to come crashing down all around me and somehow you held it together. Lord, don't let me be like one of those who come up in here and fold their arms and sit down all proud and powerful feeling like somehow they deserve to be here. Lord, I don't deserve to be here. Uh, to be honest, I don't deserve to be anywhere. And probably neither do you. I'm going to give you the last point and then we're going to pray. We understand that the first thing we've got to acknowledge is a wrath deserved. And we understand that the next thing that we've got to acknowledge is that we have to display a wisdom that really is not in us. It has to come from God. We have to make decisions that are beyond us that only God can help us make. A wrath deserved and a wisdom displayed. And once we make that connection, there's got to be a worship demonstrated. We've got to live a life that's pleasing and precious and worshipful yes. to God. <clears throat> but wonderfully, the last point that I realized in the man on the cross, acknowledging the man in the middle, was a wealth discovered. The thief said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Lord said, verily. Wait, wait, wait. You Bible readers, hold on. Remember, we decided we we're going to slow down, right? So you guys were going to keep on going, weren't you? <laughs> we know what he said. He said, verily, verily, thou shalt be with me this day in prayer. We know that, but slow down. You know what he said, but do you know what it meant? You know what that word verily means? And he said it twice. Verily means I guarantee. The actual definition is I put my guarantee on it. That's what verily means. 
And he said, verily, verily. He said, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Can you imagine Jesus the Christ looking you right in the eye in the middle of your petition? Help my desperate plight. Help my brokenness. Fix my problem. Solve this dilemma. And he says, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Just in case you didn't hear it the first time. He said, verily, verily. That word verily down south would be like show enough, basically is what he was saying. On the streets of inner city America today where I come from, that would be like he was saying, for real, for real, I ain't playing, player. Verily means take it to the bank. Verily means you can build on this right here. This is a foundation that will not move. What I'm about to tell you, I guarantee, I double guarantee. Verily, I say unto you, unto you today, thou shalt be, he said, today. You don't have to get baptized today. Day. You don't have to speak in tongues today. You don't have to be a preacher or a deacon today. You don't have to graduate from catechism. Y'all ain't helping me preach. He said, I guarantee, I guarantee today I will take you where you need to go. Hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, if you can follow through on the first three points, he always follows through on the fourth. Yes. If you would acknowledge that you deserve even worse than you're getting. Yes. Oh, some of you just bucked me right there. You said, well, you don't know how bad it, it doesn't matter how bad it is. We deserve hell. If what you get right now is not hell, if it's short of hell, it's better than what we deserve. That's the truth. Everything you get in life that is short of hell is grace. <laughs> Your truck runs, that's mercy. Your truck breaks down, that's mercy. Because they're both, both short of what you deserve. <laughs> If you could see the world and your life like this. Oh, praise God. I need to shut this down. Look with me one last time at the whole picture. And I want you to right now. As I'm gearing this thing towards a close, what normally happens is the people I need to help, as they feel me starting to shut this down, they start in their mind leaving. <laughs> start checking off the boxes of where you got to go, what you got to do, excuses and reasons why you're not going to follow through. Just, just slow down just a minute. Keep your guard down. I ain't going to hurt nobody. But, but look at the big picture. The big picture at Calvary is there are important, very important people at Calvary. There are educated people. There are religious people. There are ministry connections. There are family relations. But the one that got to go to heaven that day was a crook. That was being punished rightly for his sins that took a close enough look at Christ Jesus, that faith rose up in his heart, and he said, you know what, I'm going to give this thing a shot because I'm, I'm about to make a mess of it if I don't. Come on. And he said, Lord, I don't know if I have access. I don't know if you'll accept me. I don't know how it's going to work out, but this is the best chance I can take. Lord, wherever you're going, I'd like to go there too. Whatever you're doing, I'd like to do that too. I get it now. I get it. Do you know what the thief got? The thief got this. It has nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. That's what he got. No doubt right here, even in this little congregation. There's a good chance there's some folk here that are politically astute around here. We got some folk probably that are religiously lofty around here. We got some folk that are family connected. That much we know. We got some folk that are just out to see the show sometimes. But surely, surely, surely somebody here will get it. Yeah. Yeah. 
All you really got to understand is that you can't serve God because you mean to or because you want to, because you try hard enough to. And that even if you did, that doesn't guarantee you any perfect set of anything in your life. But that you believe with all your heart you can take your hurt and your brokenness and everything that is wrong with your mind and your heart and your home and you can always have a safety mechanism that holds it all together because you believe in the man in the middle. Because you have the belief of a thief. Amen. Stand all over this house. I feel so bad sometimes for the American church because this is the fourth or fifth or sixth generation that has been taught that there's this list of things and these certain things and then the, the, the Nazarenes are better than the Catholics and the holiness are better than the... And we got all these people so confused because they're trying to stand the right way and wear their hair the right way and check the boxes and put the right things in their home and take the right things out of their home and... And they're still miserable. And they're still broken. And it still isn't working. <laughs> All we were supposed to teach them, Brother Nathan, is that you're going to go to hell without accepting the perfect work of Calvary. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you think or how good you think you are or how bad you've been this week or anything else. You're just like the thief and you have the exact same access that he did. And if you would come to Jesus and believe on Jesus, yes. it doesn't make sense. You can't figure it out on paper. There's no math for it. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Yes. That when you just come to Jesus to just believe Jesus, he gives you something that changes everything. <laughs> I accepted him that Sunday morning at that old country church in Wilder, Idaho, and I can't even tell you how I did it. I don't know how I did it. He just acknowledged me somehow, and I just poured into him and he just took me and here we are 23 years later and I'm not bragging I know what I am I'm a punk kid from the streets of California saved by grace that's all I'll ever be and I know it but I'm bragging on God here I am 23 years and one month later I never had another drink of alcohol I never had another drug I never got divorced I did raise those two boys and I raised their little brother and I raised their little sister too. It's simpler than we've made it. We've got to get back and introduce everybody to the truth. You realize you can't make it without him. You come to him you acknowledge him as Lord. He does a work in your life. You begin to thank him and praise him for it. And miracles take place. And you keep coming back for more. That's it. <laughs> you give me a big old list and a big old catechism and take me to a finishing school or what, you, whatever. If that works for you, fine. What you need is a personal daily relationship with the man in the middle. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Mighty God in heaven, I thank you and I love you and I praise you. I worship you and glorify your holy name. You've been so good. God, I've preached what I believe you laid on my heart. 
Only you know every soul in the house. I hope some are encouraged, some are convicted, some are willing to step up and get more. Some maybe have some clarification and understand how simple it could be to just do better. But God, I pray that whatever we receive tonight, that we come down to this altar. Thank you. Kill the microphones left and right. That we come down to this altar tonight and we bow on our knees as it were before the feet of the throne of grace. And at that point, God, somebody, somebody would get it. Somebody would say, Lord, help me understand. Somebody would say, Lord, give me more. Somebody would say, thank you, God, for what you spoke into my heart tonight and help me right now tuck it down into the deepest crevices of my spirit because I'll need it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and I don't want to lose it. Hallelujah. These altars are open right now and I pray that you'd come and pray like that.